All right, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to the November and actually the last Grand Rounds for Physical Therapy for 2016. And uh, again, thank you to Dr. Patanella for getting this larger room for us. It's much more uh, comfortable than the smaller rooms. Uh, I did want to make sure everybody remembers to sign in, especially for New Jersey. Make sure you sign in the New Jersey sheet. And for New Jersey, you have to also sign out. So please do so. If you're following us online, make sure you email me for uh, your quiz and for your certificate. Um, and then make sure you pick up your certificate on your way out. Uh, today we have Dr. Hood with us. Uh, he's going to be talking about atypical BPPV, which is a uh, maybe not the atypical aspect of it, but BPPV is a very common problem, and uh, especially as we age. And uh, yeah, uh, the only other piece that I'm going to throw in here is on December 1st, next Thursday, we have research presentations by our orthopedic physical therapy residents uh, in Laros Auditorium down down the street a little bit. Uh, so we welcome you to that. It's from 12:30 to 1:30, and uh, we'd welcome to see you there. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hood. All right. So, everyone, thanks for being here today. Appreciate it. I appreciate Steve scheduling this the day before uh, a holiday as well. I'm sure everyone's very happy to be here. <laughs> so, anyway, we're going to talk about uh, BPPV. Most people know what BPPV is. Um, unfortunately, when you see in the clinic. Most BPPV doesn't present like that classic, you look in like the Herman text type of BPPV. It presents kind of atypically. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to change it up a little bit. When I've been to a bunch of these uh, grand rounds, we've seen a lot of outstanding subjects. But we're actually going to go through a case study. We're going to go through a case study that I saw last year um, that kind of hallmarks um, kind of that atypical BPPV patient that you typically see in the clinic. So uh, this basically says that I have no financial relationships to disclose. Um, with anything or any product I talk about today. So the case study. So it's an 80-year-old female. She was referred by an ENT. Uh, she woke up two nights ago with a severe spinning lasting seconds with severe nausea and vomiting. She went to the ER. She had the million-dollar workup. She was diagnosed with vertigo, and then she was sent home again. Uh, upon presentation, she denies any numbness, tingling. She denies any weakness, denies any headache, no diplopia, any, no type of speaking or swallowing issues. As far as her past medical history, you see that for someone her age, 80 years old, it's actually not that bad. Uh, she has asthma, she has hypothyroid, hypertension, arrhythmia, and she has osteoarthritis. As far as her medication list, again, for being 80 years old, it's, it's not that great. It's basically on Sotolol, Losartan, and Synthroid. And everyone knows that as you age, generally, if you're on four more medications, there's a 100% inc uh, incidence of an interaction amongst those medications. But she's actually not in that boat. She's one of the few 80-year-olds I've seen that hasn't hit that, that quota, so to speak. So she comes in, and she's very, very dizzy, extremely dizzy. She was one of those typical vertigo patients that comes in to see you, and she's literally hanging onto the wall. She's kind of using the wall as her guide. She did not want to move her head whatsoever. She was escorted by her husband. She did not drive to the appointment. She felt, excuse the expression, she felt like crap. She felt terrible that day. So on the clinical exam, neuromuscular was within normal limits. Her strength was 5 out of 5. Cranial nerve examination was completely intact. She had full field tracking, normal ocular motor screen. Her balance, she had a negative Romberg, which, as we know, it doesn't really mean much, essentially, but she had a negative Romberg. As far as any additional balance testing, I couldn't do it because she was so symptomatic. Typically, on, on a balance patient, we would do a, a more of a standardized type of balance assessment, like a dynamic gait index or a Berg or something like that. Uh, but in this case, we couldn't do anything because she was too symptomatic. As far as her vestibular exam, she had no spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus. She had a negative head impulse test bilaterally. Basically, the head impulse test essentially looks to see how the vestibular nerve on the left and right side are functioning, or whether or not they're not functioning at all. And it was perfectly normal. Okay? So from a neurological standpoint, she looks pretty OK. She looks fine. Now, when I put her through some positional testing, she had a negative Dix Hall pike, which we'll talk about in a second what that looks at. She had a positive roll test. Her symptoms were worse on the right than the left. And she had what's called an apogeotropic or ageotropic nystagmus that lasted about 90 seconds, 
with symptoms mimicking her complaint. Basically, her eyes were bouncing when I put her into a certain position, either on the left side or right side, and that corresponded or correlated with her symptoms getting worse. And her symptoms were worse uh, on the right side. I did another test on her called a, a bow and lean test, which, which looks at uh, a certain type of BPPV. Um, and she had a right beating nystagmus in the bowel. So when her head was forward, she had a right beating nystagmus. And then when she went into the lean where her head was back, she had a left beating nystagmus. Now, right now, especially if you're in sports med, you look at this and you're like, what the heck am I looking at? Okay. Well, we're going to kind of go through step by step what, it, what essentially everything means as part of the case study. So as far as the testing that we did, the Dix Hall Plague, what it is, it's a test for anterior and posterior canal BPPV. Basically, everyone's done this in school. Even athletic trainers have, have seen this in school. Is that basically you lay the person down on the bed, you have their head dipped off the back of the bed or off a pillow, about 30 degrees extension, and their head is turned 45 degrees to one side. And you're testing whatever side their head is turned towards. And what you typically see if someone has BPPV is that you're going to see a very characteristic nystagmus and the person's going to complain of vertigo or dizziness. Now, as, as far as uh, modifications, if someone has significant uh, cervical range of motion limitations, or perhaps they had a cervical fusion and you did not want to extend their neck, you can actually modify this test by having them go on pillows or actually have them on a tilt table. The test has nothing to do with the position of their head. It actually has to do with the position of the canals. So as long as the canals are 30 degrees down plane and tilted 45 degrees to either side, you're doing the Dix Hall Pike. And this is what it looks like. And there's that handsome guy there showing you what the Dix Hall Pike looks like. Okay, so that's the typical position that they would be in. And within the Dix Hall Pike, if they had BPPV in the anterior posterior canal, you would start to see a nystagmus and also they would complain of vertigo. And she did not have it. Now the roll test is also testing for BPPV, but it's testing for BPPV in the horizontal canal. Because you have three semicircular canals inside your vestibular system, your anterior, posterior, and horizontal. With the Dix Hall Pike, we're testing the anterior and posterior canal. With the, heart, with the uh, roll test, we're testing the horizontal canal. So the person lays supine, their head is flexed up about 20 degrees, and they quickly turn their head to one side. And you're testing whatever side their head is turned towards. A positive test will uh, cause nystagmus and vertigo. And this is what the roll test looks like here. You know, the, the 20 degrees of cervical flexion is, is really um, it's really difficult. You don't, have to get to, you don't have to get the goniometer and say it's exactly 20 degrees because not everyone's aligned correct, uh, the same way either. So you kind of play around with it. You might go 15 degrees. You might move it up to 30 depending on the person's range of motion and everything like that. But generally you want to hang out around 20 degrees and turn their head quickly to one side. So in this instance, I'm testing the left side. I'm always testing the down ear. And I think I was negative for that. There's some other test variants out there for BPPV. There's something called the sideline test, um, which is basically just a variant of the Dix Hall Pike. It looks for posterior canal BPPV. And then also the, the, the bow and lean test, which is, is a pretty good test. It, it's, it's not foolproof, but it's a pretty good test when you're trying to figure out what side the person has horizontal canal BPPV on. Um, and, and in this case, I used it to confirm that what, what side the person had horizontal canal BPPV. So after looking at all her diagnostics, clinical exam with the positive roll test, uh, the left not as symptomatic as the right, and positive nystagmus to the right in the bow, and positive nystagmus to the left in the lean. She probably had left cupulothiasis BPPV. Okay? Now you look at that and you're like, oh my god, what the heck is that? So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go into exactly what the cupulothiasis is. So BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, what it is, it's episodic positional vertigo caused by calcium carbonate crystals, which are called otoconia, otolith, erox, whatever you want to call it. You have these little calcium carbonate crystals that typically sit in your utricle and actually your saccule within your vestibular system. What happens, they start to break loose and they start floating in one of the semicircular canals where they shouldn't be. What will happen is that when the person uh, changes position, they'll typically have a room spinning sensation that can last anywhere from five seconds to about 90 seconds. Theoretically, if they have a certain type of BPPV, as long as they're in that position, it can last forever until you take them out of that position. In most cases, what happens is that the, this, the brain will kind of shut off the stimulation after about two minutes and they won't get uh, nystagmus or dizziness anymore. By far, it's the most common cause of peripheral vertigo, though. 
uh, out of the, the clinic we, we run, we see at least about 30% of our cases of peripheral vertigo, they have BPVV. Either it's the primary diagnosis or it's linked in with one of their diagnoses that they have. You see this all across the spectrum. You see it with TBIs, you see it with concussion, you see it with migraineurs, um, you see young and old, I've treated kids with this, I've treated nine and 10 year olds with this, I treated people who are 100 years old with this. You see it all across the continuum. So really, it doesn't matter which clinic you work in, you're typically gonna see this. And what will happen is that you'll typically see these people and they're coming into you for a knee replacement or they're coming into you for knee surgery or something, they don't wanna lay down. And, and you ask them why they don't want to lay down and they want three or four pillows to uh, lay up on the plinth on, and they say, oh, I get dizzy if I lay down. That's kind of the red flag that they probably have BPPV. About one third of patients spontaneously resolve within three weeks, which is actually a good thing. So in most cases, the person kind of sticks with it long enough. Eventually, it's going to go away. Typically, in our clinic, we see the ones that don't go away. We don't go away. But most importantly, and you saw from the clinical exam, it's a mechanical problem. So when you see the person's eyeballs bouncing back and forth like a ping pong ball, it doesn't mean you have to call the squad right away. Okay? If you do a very basic clinical neuro exam, you can rule out whether or not they're having something neurological versus something mechanical like BPPV. So what happens is that the otoconia or EROX, they break loose from the utricle and they float into one of the semicircular canals. Now when you look at the semicircular canals, there, there's a reason why one is more affected than the other. So right down here, you have, you have your three semicircular canals, and this whole picture is a picture of your, of your vestibular system. And you have a vestibular system on your left side and, and right side. And these canals are set at right angles with one another. And there's a very important reason why. Now, within the canals, there's fluid, there's endolymph. And so when you turn your head in different directions, the fluid moves. And when that fluid moves, it deflects the little cupula, which is the little sensor at the base of each canal. And when that cupula gets deflected, it sends information back to your brain, whether you're moving left and right or up and down. Essentially, your vestibular system tells your brain where you are in space. So if you have a dysfunction of your vestibular system, you lose total orientation of where you are in space. So when people have a vestibular dysfunction like BPPV, it's extremely uh, concerning to the person. They don't know what up and down is for a split second while they're, while they're having that episode. And if they have anxiety or panic already uh, predisposed to that, it can absolutely trigger anxiety and panic. And they can get really dizzy, really lightheaded, and extremely symptoma symptomatic for a long period of time, even after the stimulation goes away. So because the otoconia, the ear rocks, they have a mass. And we all know because of gravity, mass is going to go to the most gravity-dependent de uh, portion. And so when you look at the canals, the posterior canal is the most gravity-dependent or the lowest canal within the vestibular system. The horizontal canal is the second lowest, and the anterior canal is the highest, if you will. So the ear rocks or the otoconia generally are going to go into the posterior canal more often. So depending on what you, what you look at, what study you look at, you're going to see that the posterior canal is affected about 94% of the time. And, and depending on the study, it's going to be anywhere from about 85 to like 95%. The horizontal canal is second most. Okay? It's about anywhere from about 4 to 6%. And the horizontal canals, the way they're oriented, they're oriented about 30 degrees off plane from parallel with the floor. So it's going to make sense when we ta start talking about the, the roll test. Okay, the roll test, how we want to bring the canals down about 20 degrees, well, it's basically just to get the, the horizontal canals into the proper plane when we're doing the roll test when we're moving their head. Okay. And the anterior canal is, is the rarest, generally about 1% to 2%. The, the anterior canal, you know, depending on who you read, they're going to say it's more affected or not. Personally, I've been doing this for um, almost 20 years now, and I've seen a handful of anterior canal BPPV. And if you look at the orientation, unless that person's doing handstands and stuff like that, it's really difficult uh, to, to get debris into your air, anterior canal. Uh, there, there's certain clinicians I know out in uh, uh, Chicago, there's certain clinicians that say there's a much higher predisposition to have an anterior canal BPPV, but at least where I practice, I really haven't seen it. So when you're looking at BPPV, if you want to play the odds and you're not quite sure what you're looking at, 94% of the time it's going to be in the posterior canal. So if you're playing the odds, you're going to treat the posterior canal most of the time. Okay? It can be often due to a head trauma or neuronitis, which is an infection of your inner ear. 
But in many cases, the, the reason why a person has BPPV is unknown. We, we don't know why they have it, essentially. They show up in the clinic and they get dizzy. So like I said before, about 50% are idiopathic. Generally, as you get older, you do see a higher predisposition to BPPV. Um, but it, again, it doesn't uh, hold true in all cases. You do see kids with it. You see teenagers, adults. Usually when you see the, the kids, the teenagers, and adults, usually it's more towards trauma. Um, in, in our clinic, we generally will we'll see it with concussion once in a while with kids. Uh, you'll see it with whiplash TBI. You'll see it with viral neuritis or neuritis, labyrinthitis. Um, it's basically all the same infection. It's just depending on where the infection uh, affects your inner ear. Uh, some neurologists might call it vestibulopathy if you're working in acute care. It's basically all the same infection. They, they think the, inf the infection is a, a herpes simplex virus, not to sexually transmitted type, that for some reason it will express itself and it will inflame the vestibular nerve. And because of that inflammation, it kind of uh, knocks out the top two canals and actually the posterior canal is still working okay, and that's the reason why a person has BPPV. And then you also see it with VBI, occasionally with VBI. But in most cases, there's no, not going to be any rhyme or reason why the person has it. So when you're looking at BPPV, there's two types. There's canalithiasis and there's cupulothiasis. So you get the debris, breaks out of the oconia, it starts floating in one of the canals. In most cases, it's a posterior canal. And in most cases, it's going to be canalithiasis. And it basically means that the debris is free-floating the, uh, within the, cup within the uh, canal. And when that debris is free-floating there, when you move your head, either lie down or sit back up, the debris will move. It creates kind of a, a wake or a negative pressure, and it deflects the cupula. And when that cupula gets deflected, it sends information back up your vestibular nerve that you're moving when you're really not. And the person's going to feel a spinning sensation because of that. Now, because of the orientation of these canals, these canals are actually linked up with very specific eye muscles. Okay? And again, we only have an hour, so we're not going to get into it. But because of that, you're going to see a very characteristic type of eye movement, a very characteristic type of nystagmus, depending on which canal is affected. Now, because the debris is free-floating within canalithiasis, when you put them in a Dick's Hall plate, there can be a latency. And it basically means that it takes a couple seconds for those ear rocks to kind of start moving within the canal. It's kind of like an avalanche, where you have a little bit of the debris start moving first, and then all of a sudden you have a lot of debris moving, and it reaches kind of crescendo with all the debris moving down the avalanche, and then it kind of tapers off a little bit. Well, the same thing happens with canalithiasis within your inner ear. You get a little bit of debris, it takes a couple seconds for the uh, symptoms to come on, then the symptoms really come on, you start seeing the nystagmus, you start seeing the person feeling really dizzy, and then it kind of tapers off. And it usually only lasts about five to 30 seconds. Now, in cupulothiasis, what happens, these little ear rocks here, they'll actually adhere directly onto the cupula, onto the little sensor in there. And so when the person goes into whatever position, either the dix hall plate or the roll test, what will happen is that that cupula will deflect immediately because it turns it into a gravity sensor, if you will. And as soon as that cupula gets deflected, what will happen is that that vertigo will start immediately. That nystagmus will start immediately. And the symptoms will last a lot longer because as long as that cupula is getting deflected, they're going to constantly get symptoms. And so theoretically, it can last forever as long as you keep them in that position. But like I said, usually their brain or central nervous system will shut off the stimulation. It's not going to last any more than about two minutes. But in most cases, it's going to last about 30 to 90 seconds. About 30 to 90 seconds. So these are the two types, canalithiasis, cupulothiasis. Cupul uh, canalithiasis is more common. Okay, cupulothiasis is less common. So when we're looking at atypical BPPV, we're not looking at posterior canal, and we're not looking at canalithiasis. We're looking at anterior canal, cupulo or canalithiasis. We're looking at horizontal canal, cupulo or canalithiasis. Or we're looking at posterior canal, cupulothiasis. And we saw in our case study we had a horizontal cupulothiasis. Okay, here's a wonderful uh, hand drawn picture of BPV. And basically, it's the otoconia. This is canalithiasis because you see the debris free floating within the canal. If it was cupulothiasis, you would see this little debris actually adherent right onto the cupula, right onto the, the sensor, if you will. As far as where it comes from, it usually comes from the utricle. Okay, the utricle is one of our sensors, sense acceleration. It kind of sits in the bulbous portion in between all the canals in something called our vestibule. So when you're looking at BPV, the most telling is really the history. 
people are usually most symptomatic in the morning because they sleep all the debris essentially kind of goes down to the most gravity dependent portion of the canal and then when they go to get up first thing in the morning that debris starts to move within the canal goes to the most gravity dependent portion they start to feel the spinning and they start to feel the vertigo you see it with getting out of bed when people are on the creeper and they're working on the car because when they're working on the car basically they're in a dick's hall pike position and also you, you hear about especially a lot of older women when they go to the beauty parlor um, when they put their hair back into the sink to get it washed, essentially that's a Dick's Hall Pike, and they start to get vertigo with that. Um, so you, you can ask, also look at the dentist. When someone's at the dentist, they might get the, um, because again, they're in it, that Dick's Hall Pike position, they might get uh, symptoms as well. So as far as the diagnostics with BPBB, they're either going to have a positive Dick's Hall Pike, a positive roll test, or a positive sideline test. And as far as the Dick's Hall Pike and the roll test being uh, diagnostic, you know, from a, a sensitivity and specificity uh, uh, perspective, it's extremely accurate. It's highly accurate, well into the high 80s, low 90 percentile for sensitivity and specificity. So essentially, when you see a positive Dix Hall Pike and roll test, you can rest assured that most likely it is BPPV. Some of the patient descriptors, they'll typically feel a room spinning sensation, dizzy, wavy, movement, nausea, funny, muddy woozy sensation. Most people, if they're not on medication, they'll get a pure room spinning sensation. When you see people who are a little older and they're on a lot of uh, psychotropic medication or a lot of central nervous system suppressants like Ativan and things like that, you might not necessarily see as much nystagmus because it's suppressing their central nervous system. And you might complain more of being wavy. But with the classic BPPV is you'll see the nystagmus and you'll see, uh, and the person will complain of vertigo. So some of the patient questions to ask them. If a person does not lay flat at night, screen for BPPV. Okay, it doesn't matter what you're seeing them for. Okay, if you're seeing them for a knee or something like that, if they want to uh, be upright on three or four pillows, they very well could have BPPV. Anyone over 65 with a balance problem, screen for BPPV, because in many cases, what will happen is that they'll avoid those positions, and when you're over the age of 65, BPPV can greatly affect your balance, even when you're not actively symptomatic with the vertigo. And then many people avoid positions of causing dizziness. They forget why they started sleeping on three or four pillows. So really believe no one. Believe no one. Now, like I said before, the diagnosis is based upon symptom duration. Chemothiasis, you get it from 5 to 30 seconds of, of uh, nystagmus and vertigo. And with cupulothiasis, anywhere from about 30 to 90 seconds. It really more, it's more towards 60 to 90 seconds with cupula. So as far as BPV, when you look at the eyes, what you're going to see, if the person's in a Dick's Hall Pike and they have posterior uh, canal BPV, whether it's canalothiasis or cupulothiasis, you're going to see an upbeat torsional astagmus. Basically, the eye is going to move fast, upbeat and torsional like that. And if you have them on the right Dick's Hall Pike, it will be upbeat and torsional to the right. If you have them in the left Dick's Hall Pike, it will be upbeat and torsional to the left. Most cases, that's what you're going to see. Again, if you're playing the odds, 94% of the time it's going to be posterior canal. Not quite sure what you're looking at. Treat the posterior canal. If you see a, in a Dick's Hall Pike a downbeat and torsional nystagmus, it's more likely anterior canal. So the fast phase or the beating is going to be going fast down and torsional. Okay, that's going to be anterior canal BPV. And again, the right Dick's Hall Pike you're testing the right anterior canal. Left Dick's Hall Pike you're testing the left anterior canal. Now, in our case study case, we saw that they had a more of a lateral beating nystagmus. So in the case of a roll test, if they have a geotropic nystagmus, or basically it means that the fast phase is beating faster towards the floor when you have them in the roll test. So if I'm in the left roll test and the nystagmus is going faster to the left or faster down towards the ground, that's called geotropic nystagmus. Now, geotropic nystagmus generally means the person has kenolithiasis. If you see ageotropic or apogeotropic nystagmus, so if I'm in the left roll test and I see the fast phase going upbeat towards the right or laterally to the right, that's apogeotropic nystagmus, generally that means they're going to have cupulothiasis. Now, the thing about the roll test or the horizontal canal is that the horizontal canal are set 30 degrees off plane from parallel with the floor and the left and right to work together. So as you're exciting one side, you're inhibiting the other. But because if you have debris on one side, you're still getting stimulation of that side even when you're in the opposite roll test. So you're going to see the nystagmus in both roll tests. 
So if someone has canalithiasis, you're going to see geotropic nystagmus on the left side and geotropic nystagmus on the right side. And that's what typically blows people's brains up is like, oh my God, why do I have nystagmus on both sides? Okay. But in canalithiasis, it's both on, on the same, each side, geotropic. If they have cupelothiasis, they're going to have ageotropic nystagmus on the left and ageotropic nystagmus on the right. So they're going to have a, a right beating nystagmus on the left roll test and a right beating, and a, a right beating nystagmus on the left roll test and a left beating nystagmus on the right roll test. And so how do you tell this apart it is that with cupelothiasis, generally the involved side is going to be the less symptomatic side in the roll test. With canalithiasis, the more symptomatic side is going to be the positive side or the side indicative of the BPV. It's confusing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Took me a long time to figure that one out. Okay, a lot of reading, a lot of reading. So let's look at an nystagmus video so you can kind of see what I'm talking about here. Hopefully this loads up. Okay, that I actually see a little bit of torsional when it has not back in position. Now, this is the person's left, this is the person's right. So you name the nystagmus based upon the person's orientation, not your own. Okay, so we see right now they have a left beating nystagmus in the right position. We have fast beating going to the left. Watch what happens when you go to the left. See, it stops, and then all of a sudden, because the debris moves, it goes back the opposite way. See how robust it is now to the right side when they're on the left roll test. Can you imagine what you would feel like if that happens to you? <laughs> like, seriously, your eyeballs are bouncing around like ping pong balls. So they have horizontal cupola thiasis. Now, they probably have it on the left side there. Okay. So it puts up a different perspective on it when you actually see the eyes persons, the eyes move like that, correct? Now, with, BP, with horizontal canal BPVV, the eyes are generally going to have a very robust type of nystagmus, okay? Because their horizontal canals are essentially in the same plane as moving your head left to right, they don't want to move their head at all. That's the reason why they're walking into the clinic like this. They, they do not want to move their head. Okay, anytime they move their head, they start to get in a status like that. So you can see why they want to, they don't want to, I think I'm to shut this off. Gotta love YouTube. <laughs> Gotta love YouTube. So now we got to look at, well, how do you treat it? Well, we know it's a mechanical problem, okay? We, we know it's not really a neurological problem in, in any respect. And if we do a very specific maneuver on the person, we can move those crystals back out of the canal, back into the vestibule, basically into the utricle, where they get reabsorbed again and the person's asymptomatic. The nice thing about BPV, because it's a mechanical problem, if you do it right, the next day, that person's good to go. And they're kissing your feet. They absolutely love it because in most cases, they've been to many different practitioners. No one could figure out what, what's going on. When you treat them, it was literally one treatment. They, they think it's like the best thing since sliced cake, okay, since sliced bread. So you want to look at the EBM, the evidence-based med medicine, and look for the most effective treatment in the clinical studies. The one thing you want to watch out for, and it's funny because I just had a patient yesterday who was, uh, she was younger, she was 38, came in with BPBV, and she was watching YouTube videos trying to treat herself. You got to watch that. There's many self-treatment guides online, and many of them are horribly wrong. A lot of them come from, you know, I, I was looking last night. I saw some videos from China that were trying to do some of the maneuvers on there, and they were just totally wrong. They're completely wrong based upon the modeling and everything. So you got to watch what you look for, okay? So the patient can really treat themselves the wrong way. They can treat the wrong canal. Possibly they can convert it to a different canal and make themselves feel 10 times worse. So for anterior and posterior cupelothiasis, and again, we're talking about atypical BPV, the, the classic one is called Brandt-Daroff, okay? 
Now, Brent Daroff exercises have really fallen out of favor because there's newer maneuvers out there that work much quicker. The, the classic Brent Daroff, basically the person throws himself side to side on the bed and they do it anywhere from about five to 20 times, two or three times a day. And over the span of about two weeks, they feel better. Well, you can see that if you felt like that in nystagmus, you don't want to wait two weeks to feel better. So you can see why this kind of fallen out of favor. Um, the one thing, it does have about a 95% re-emission rate, but you have to watch it out a little bit when you look at the studies because we know about 30% of all PBV is going to resolve spontaneously within three weeks. And this takes up to two weeks to be effective, so you wonder, okay, well, how much is spontaneously resolving versus how much is actually the brands actually making better? The one thing about brands I can tell you is that less is more. When I've ever given this out, I typically don't give it for PPV, but I'll only give them a max of five reps because I don't know who has time to do 20 reps at home. Um, there's better treatments for cubulothiasis available, but there is a place for it in, in vestibular therapy. And this is what it looks like is that the person, person basically turns their head one direction, they very quickly lie down, they wait until the symptoms pass plus 30 seconds, they sit back up, wait till symptoms pass plus 30 seconds, and then they lie down with their head turns the opposite way very quickly, wait until symptoms pass plus 30 seconds, and they sit back up, wait till symptoms pass plus 30 seconds, and they do it five times each direction. Okay, it looks like fun, doesn't it? So if you're feeling like that, you can see why you probably don't want to have the patient do it because they'll be kind of busy for a long period of time. Now, with horizontal canal cupulothiasis, okay, so this one we talked about the anterior and posterior canals. With the horizontal canal cupulothiasis, like our patient that we talked about, you can perform a modified branch exercise. And again, it can take up to two weeks to resolve. And basically all you're doing is that you're doing a modification of the roll test. And you have the person, their head on the pillow, elevated 20 degrees to put the horizontal canal into play. And you have them very quickly roll their head to one side, wait until symptoms pass plus 30 seconds, and then quickly roll their head to the other side, wait until symptoms pass plus 30 seconds. And you can do it five times. Now what you're trying to do during all these maneuvers for cupulothiasis is that you're trying to break the debris off the cupula. Okay? So if you will, we're trying to convert the BPV from cupulothiasis, where it's adherent onto the cupula, into catalithiasis, where it's free-floating then, where it's free-floating. Some of the other maneuvers out there for horizontal canal canalithiasis, something called a, a Guffoni uh, maneuver. It's been found to be about 61% effective, where the person quickly uh, side lies on their unaffected side. They stay there for two minutes, and then they rapidly rotate their head 45 degrees downwards, and they stay there for about two minutes. And the person slowly sits up. And you basically do it until they're, they're asymptomatic. Okay, no more than generally three times per session. See, so they're sitting there. Okay, they go on to their unaffected side, they quickly turn their head, uh, stay there for two minutes, quickly turn their head 45 degrees downward, stay there for two minutes, and then sit back up. So this one works much quicker, as you can see. This one works much quicker. So the next day they're generally feeling okay after that one. With the Cassani maneuver, okay, this treats horizontal semicircular canal cupulothiasis. So this, this treats the adherent uh, debris on the cupula. It's also called the Guffoni treatment for cupulothiasis. This gets confusing, doesn't it? Okay, all these Italians decide they want to name these maneuvers after themselves. You know, this one has a 93% remission rate, and so the patient patient quickly lies down on their affected side. They hold for one minute, and they quickly turn their head up 45 degrees, hold for two three minutes, and then they sit up with their head in neutral. And this is what it looks like. Now with the Guffoni, I can tell you, this is like a body slam. Okay, this isn't like lying down, like I'm going to bed, no big deal. This is like the person's head, <coughs> boom, they're down. So in Europe, they tend to do these maneuvers a lot. In the United States, we tend to shy away from these maneuvers a little bit. Part of it's because of the litigious you know, nature of, of our healthcare society, unfortunately. We don't want to hurt anyone. Um, but these maneuvers do work. So you lie down quickly onto your side, affected side, then you quickly turn your head up. And then you sit back up again. And it's done multiple times, again. And it's very, very quick, very quick. Another thing you can do for a horizontal canalithiasis is something called the Venucci maneuver. And basically, all you're doing is that you're having the person lie on their affected side. So you're having to do something they really don't want to do. So they go to bed, they lie on their affected side. They wait about a minute, they wait about two minutes, and then they can roll 
slowly onto their other side and they sleep on their unaffected side all, all night. Okay. Now, as far as studies go, there's one outstanding study in 2004 showed 100% remission, but there's only two subjects in the study. <laughs> so you got to take it with a grain of salt a little bit. I take it with a grain of salt. Um, the one thing about atypical BPPV is that all these maneuvers have very limited studies on them. If we're talking about posterior canalothiasis BPV, there are literally hundreds of studies on it and extremely effective. We start talking about atypical BPV because there's not a lot of cases. It's hard to get a large cohort. There's mostly case studies and there's very, there's very limited studies out there on it. One of the variants for anterior canal BPV, one of the testing variants, is head hanging. So basically, you kind of do a Dix Hall Pike, but for the anterior canal, you have them maximally extend their head in, in midline as far as they can go. And the way that our anterior canals are, are oriented, basically it aligns our anterior canals as most gravity dependent and will have that debris move downward. Sometimes in the classic Dix Hall Pike, it's not enough of an angle to really get that anterior canal um, to be most gravity dependent, so you really have to bring their head back further. So this is a testing variant for anterior canal that has only been around really in popularity for a couple of years now. One of the new maneuvers for anterior canal is uh, the deep head hanging maneuver. So this will actually treat it it's for anterior canal canalithiasis. The person goes into that deep head hanging position, and then they flex their, they, they stay there until symptoms pass plus about 30 seconds, and then they flex their neck into a full chin tuck when they come up, and they stay there for until symptoms pass plus 30 seconds, and they sit back up. Now, as far as this maneuver goes, to be honest with you, I don't think I've never used it because I don't see anterior canal, but it's out there. And some of the clinicians that say they've seen anterior canal have seen good results with it, but again, there's very limited studies on out there on it. For anterior canal cupelothiasis, I get so confused between the three canals. One of the, the treatments is, is the liberatory maneuver for the anterior canal. Now, the liberatory maneuver, it sounds like it, it says. Basically, it's trying to liberate the debris off the cupula. So again, it's done extremely fast. This is another body slam maneuver. This is another one where they go down, they're going down hard. So you got to watch who you deal with. Now I couldn't even find a, a proper picture for the anterior canal liberatory. This is the classic liberatory. Um, so basically what the person does, they sit on the bed, they turn their head 45 degrees towards the affected ear, and they quickly lie down on the side towards their affected ear. So they would be in this position first. They wait one to two minutes. And then they very, very quickly, okay, I'm talking body slam quick, come back all the way to the opposite side. And they stay there for one to two minutes. And you do it several times. And you can see here that if you have someone who's 60, 70, 80 years old, they have arthritis, and you're trying to body slam them, it gets kind of tough. They have a lot of thoracic kyphosis. Or even if they're younger and they've had like a fusion done or any sort of back surgery, it's a very difficult maneuver to do. So you can see here that with cupelothiasis, there's a lot of options out there, but based upon my patient, I might not be able to possibly use all of them in my arsenal because of her age and some of her past medical history. Some of the newer treatments for posterior canal, canalothiasis, this one really does not have a lot of research on it, but I, I like to show it. It's called a half somersault. It was uh, there's an ENT out in Denver. Her name's Dr. Foster. She came up with it. She's got lots of YouTube videos on it, but no studies to back it up. She calls it a half somersault, where it's a passive slow movement where the person basically dips their head underneath their legs, and they hold the position for 30 seconds, and eventually they just kind of sit on all fours and turn their head. Really, there's limited studies on it. There's lots of videos, but limited studies on it. It's interesting, but I'm not going to start using it until I see some studies showing its efficacy. So as far as treatment for horizontal canal canalithiasis, you can do something called the uh, H canal canalith reposition treatment, the CRT, which is also called the barbecue roll or the Lempert maneuver. Now as far as this maneuver, there's a lot of studies on it. The cure rate is very similar to a normal canalith reposition treatment for posterior canal BPV. And there's a couple of variations to it. So this is the treatment for horizontal canalithiasis BPV is that the person basically goes into the roll test uh, that made them symptomatic. They stay there until symptoms pass plus 30 seconds. They rotate their head to the opposite side, wait till symptoms pass plus 30 seconds. Then they roll onto their stomach, maintaining 20 degrees of next flexion 
wait till symptoms pass those 20 seconds. Some clinicians might have them go up onto uh, their, their elbows, but when you have someone go up on their elbows, it's all about the position of the canal. You gotta watch out, make sure they're not bringing their head up like that because then you're gonna ruin the maneuver. And then you have them roll onto their left side or lie supine with their head to the left, wait the symptoms pass plus 30 seconds, and then you have them sit back up. Okay, so basically it's like a person was on a barbecue spit and you just did a 360 on them. And again, you do it until they have no nystagmus and dizziness when they're doing it. Okay, really, it shouldn't take you any more than three maneuvers uh, during a session. So as far as uh, my patient, I had to think, okay, well, she's 80 years old. She had very severe neck osteoarthritis. She did not want to move her, her neck. Plus, because she was holding her head so still, she had a lot of soft tissue tightness. So, you know, I thought about manually treating her and loosening up her neck and doing it that way. But to be honest with you, I wanted to get rid of her dizziness as quickly as possible. So I had to think, okay, well, how are we going to modify her treatment a little bit? Well, what we did, and what I did, was that I modified the horizontal cantilever repositioning treatment, um, basically the barbecue roll, except they did it really fast. I did it fast so I could try to free some of that debris. So instead of doing it nice and slow where the debris is free floating, I did it fast almost kind of a hybrid way um, to kind of get the debris moving. She could not tolerate Samantz or any of the variants. And I actually, instead of just turning her head, I had her roll her whole body very fast so we could protect her cervical spine. So I did it twice on her, and she was very nauseous after two maneuvers. I couldn't do anything else on her. I didn't want her vomiting in my clinic. You know, in our clinic, we have a very good record about people not vomiting. We have basins <laughs> everywhere, but, you know, I haven't had anyone vomit in probably about two years in my clinic. Okay. Basically, you know, when I when I teach and I and therapists are always worried about having people vomit in their clinic. You know, you're gonna you know who's gonna vomit before you ever do maneuvers. Don't do the maneuver then. Okay. Call the physician, get something for the nausea, have them come back, and then do the maneuver. Okay. BPV is not gonna kill them, so it's okay to wait a couple days if they need to get medication in them. I also instructed her to sleep on her left side, uh, force prolonged positioning. Okay. And then uh, we'll go to her left side and go on her right. And then overall, she was nauseous after the session. Her husband drove her home. And really, she had no restrictions. I didn't put a cervical collar on her. I told her not to. There was no restrictions on her whatsoever. Well, she came back the next day. She wanted to be fixed really quick because I think it was around the holidays or something was going on. And she felt a lot better, but she still had spinning getting out of bed this morning. When I looked at her again, she still had a positive left roll test for uh, – left horizontal canal cupulothiasis. And so I realized, okay, well, my modification to the barbecue roll didn't work. So what I did is I gave her a quick horizontal canal brant. So basically it's that roll test where you do it real quick. But again, her, net, her cervical spine was limited, so instead of just having her head go, I had her roll real quick to one side. And we did it in the clinic. And uh, I also performed a cantilever repositioning treatment in case I converted it in the clinic. So I had her do a set of five in the clinic very quickly, and then I did the barbecue roll on it because in case I loosen that debris off the cupula and it's free floating, while she still has BPV, I got to make sure I clear that canal to BPV. I also had her sleep on her left side, and then after treatment, you know, remarkably, um, she felt great. She had no vertigo. She felt much better. She she was much better, much better. So then I followed up with her four days later. And what we see is that she had no symptoms since she was last seen. She was able to sleep on really either side without symptoms. She had a negative Dix Hall Pike and roll test bilaterally. You know, I, I could actually test her balance, and she's 80 years old. She scored a 22 out of 24 on dynamic eight index, which is good for someone who's 80, year, 80 years old. And most importantly, she was able to do everything around the house, go back to her normal life. She was able to drive in everything without symptoms. Okay. So, you know, in, in this case, it's, it's a matter of kind of looking out, you know, in the literature, seeing what's out there, you know, seeing what your patient can possibly do and modifying the maneuvers a little bit based upon how your patient presents and just kind of problem solving a little bit based upon, well, if something with one maneuver doesn't work, well, there's always something else you can try out there and, and figure it out that way. And in her case, she uh, responded extremely well and uh, she was extremely happy. And I know I pretty much have a lifelong patient now. So, so any questions?
Yes. Uh, so in this case, she was seen in the ED or her family doc first. Do you ever run into issues with someone that's seen given medication to help with the nausea? Oh, all things? the time, yeah. Does it suppress the response when you go to test them? That's a great question because one of the major uh, medications they give in the, in the ED is meclizine or, or anivert. Now, what all meclizine is is an antihistamine, and so it's going to—it's a really old one. It's going to suppress your central nervous system, so it's basically going to shut down how your, your vestibular system and your brain are talking. In the case of BPV, because it's a mechanical problem, it's going to shut it down a little bit, but in most cases, you're still going to see the nystagmus. You're still going to see the nystagmus. If it was a, a pure neurological issue, like a, a peripheral inner ear dysfunction, it might shut down what we see. But in the case of BPV, usually you can still see it. That's a really good question. Yes. So then do you ask your patients before they come in not to take that medication just in case, or do you not say that? Like, how do you go about that? If, if, I, if I know the person needs to get testing, like a VNG or something like that, where we really need to see what's happening, we tell them not to take the medication. But in the case of I just want to get them in the clinic initially, I'm not going to tell them not to take it the first time. But if I suspect that the medication is suppressing something, then I'll tell them, I'll recommend not to take it. Now, there's a caveat to that, though, because as a physical therapist, I cannot prescribe medication. Okay? I cannot prescribe the prescription medication. So if the person's medication says take two to three times a day, I can't really modify that prescription. But if it says take you know, two to three times a day as needed, I can recommend to the patient that not take it during that day and leave it up to them not to take it. But you know, if, it, if it's the, the if it's the former, then I would have to call the physician and be like, look, you know, we need to take this person off the meclizine. Do you have any problem with that? Okay. Any other? Yes. There's been a lot of therapists that, that, you know, the theory behind, if you vibrate right behind the mastoid on the affected side, the theory behind is that the vibration is going to break loose the cupola, or the, the debris off the cupola. Unfortunately, in the studies that have looked at it, there is no difference whether or not you use the, the, the mastoid vibration or not. Um, and, and my caveat to that is, well, if you're doing it on the mastoid, you're really vibrating the, the entire vestibular system. Who's to say you're not going to vibrate the utricle and actually cause more debris to actually break loose too? So I, I generally don't do it. A lot of therapists do use it, but there's, no, there's nothing in the literature that says it's going to make it any better or any worse. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> That's a, that's a great question. So you're basically looking at the vertebral artery. So a vertebral artery test, and do you screen for VBI? Well, when you look at the Dix Hall Pike, it's not a true vertebral artery test because you're not going to full range uh, rotation and not full range extension. When you actually look at the literature on the vertebral artery test, it has a 0% sensitivity and a 0% specificity. So basically it means it's not testing what it really needs to test for. So no, I don't, I don't screen for VBI. Now, if I have someone in a Dick's Hall Pike and they start seeing black spots and feeling like they're going to pass out, what do you think I do? I get them out of the position right away. Exactly. Then I'm suspecting VBI and then I'll move on from there. Okay. Any other questions? All right, you guys were great. Thanks a lot.